That speaker for this evening is Sheikh Abdurrahim Green. Before I call upon Sheikh Abdurrahim Green on stage, I will try to introduce him to all of you. Abdurrahim Green was born in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. His father was a colonial administrator of the British Empire. By the time he was walking, the old colonies were getting their independence and his family moved back to the United Kingdom. He was sent to a Roman Catholic monastic boarding school, Gilling Castle, and then on to Appleforth College. It was there that he really started to question what life was all about and how much sense the traditions he was being brought up with really made. It was while he was working in the city of London that he started to delve into every aspect of spirituality, psychology, philosophy, and that came to a head. It was when he picked up a copy of the Quran. Upon reading it, he was convinced that it was a revelation from God Almighty, and thus started his journey to Islam. This was way back in 1987, and since then, he has been involved in speaking and spreading this peaceful message of Islam. And it is this that has brought Sheikh Abdurrahim Green to dispel the very myths and to educate and inculcate the truth about the most misunderstood subjects, which is also the topic of his talk today, women in Islam, liberated or subjugated. Please welcome Sheikh Abdurrahim Green. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئة أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. When we examine this issue of women in Islam, subjugated or liberated. It may seem obvious, certainly to those people who are not Muslim, they view the woman in Islam to be someone who is subjugated. In fact, some of them refer to women in Islam as being second class citizens. And they point out, for example, how the Muslim woman is forced, and of course they like to spice it up. We're not the only ones who like spice. They like spice as well. They like to spice up their words. So the Muslim woman, she is subjugated and she is forced to wear this hijab and this niqab and this garment that prevents them from doing anything in life. And they are forced to do that by their men. And this, they say, is a sign of man's authority over women in Islam. They claim the hijab is a sign of man's authority and domination over women, which they claim is what Islam teaches. They look at the woman in Islam as being 
no more than a domestic servant who is mistreated, beaten regularly by her husband, which is justified by him through verses of the Quran. Her witness is considered half of that of a man. And they bring up many different claims to show in their mind how the position of women in Islam is the position of a second class citizen. She can't be a leader. She can't be a judge. She can't lead the prayers. She can't do this and she can't do that. These are their claims. And so it may seem obvious that the woman in Islam is subjugated. And you know what? I'm going to agree. Yes. Women in Islam are subjugated. It's true. In fact, what does the word Islam mean? The word Islam means submission, surrender, subjugation. Actually, not only are women in Islam subjugated, men in Islam are subjugated to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what being a Muslim means. That we subject our will to Allah's will. We subject our desires to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we give priority to what Allah wants over what we want. And we give priority to the guidance of Allah over the ideas of our limited intellect. This is what being a Muslim fundamentally means. But everyone is subjugated to someone or to something. We are all in a state of submission and surrender to someone or to something. And this is true even in the West where they talk about freedom. But the West is not free. You're not free to do anything you want in the West. You're not free to drive on the wrong side of the road. You're not free to go through a red traffic light. You're not free to park anywhere you want. You're not free to drive your car even without wearing a safety belt. You're not free to kill, murder, rape and steal and do whatever you want. There is no such thing as true freedom. It doesn't have a meaning. Freedom. Freedom from what? Every society, whenever people live together, they need rules in which to govern their behavior. And all of us as human beings, we do things in our life to please our parents, to please our friends, to please our wife or our husband or our children. And those things that we do, maybe we don't want to do them. Maybe we don't feel like doing them. Maybe I'd much rather be doing something else. But why do I do that? Why do I do those things? Because I love my children. I love my wife. You love your husband. You submit out of love. Or perhaps sometimes you submit out of fear. Or sometimes you submit because you know that's the right thing to do. But human beings, all human beings, whether they're Muslim or not, they are living in states of submission. But being a Muslim, means that we submit to Allah. The one that we submit to, the one that we surrender to, more than anything else and above anything else, is Allah. And that's why every Muslim, whether you're a man or a woman, is truly liberated. Because we are liberated from submitting and surrendering ourselves to the people and to the things and to the ideas of this world. We are liberated from submitting ourselves to them and we find liberty. We find freedom in the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is the greatest freedom that a person can ever enjoy. Is to be free from the creation and to be truly a slave to Allah. And that is what defines the Muslim, whether you are a man or a woman. And that primarily, my dear brothers and sisters, is my answer to this issue 
about women in Islam subjugated or liberated. A Muslim woman, a true Muslim woman, she is subjugated to Allah. And she is subjugated to the guidance of Allah. And she is subjugated to the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But that liberates her. It liberates her. It should liberate her from being subjugated to false ideas, false ideologies, false concepts. Of course, I know that what you are expecting me to talk about is the status of women in Islam vis-a-vis -vis the status of women in the West. And I don't want to spend too much time on this issue because I've given other talks on it, but I'm not going to neglect this topic altogether. I would like to mention something here, and I've got an article taken, interestingly enough, from a newspaper in UK. And uh, this article, subhanAllah, was in the paper just the other day before I came here. And I tore it out because I thought this is perfect for my talk here in Dubai. Here's the title of the article. Here's the title of the article. Listen to this. When women got out of the home and into a life. When women got out of home and into a life. Ever heard that expression? Get a life. Get a life. So here it is. You women, this is what this article is suggesting. You women will only get a life when you get out of your home. And the article is talking about a book. And this book is called The Feminine Mystique. And this book was a groundbreaking book written by a feminist author. And she was basically challenging the idea that the woman her place was in the home. This author was claiming in her book, The Feminine Mystique, that this mystique, this idea of the domesticated woman, the one who stays at home and looks after the kids, this is a mystique. It should be done away from. Women should be out there. They should be enjoying the life. They should be working. They should be studying. They should become astronauts. They should... <laughs> do all of these things and you know women should be out there doing all of those things so this is the book but actually you may think that this article is a pro feminist article by the title but this article has got a little sting in the tail it's quite interesting I want to read what the writer of the article says she says the feminine mystique that work-life balance or indeed child care would ever be a problem. You'd never imagine from this book that the problem between your work life and your home life and child care would ever be a problem. So she's actually saying that this book, The Feminine Mystique, which is criticizing the woman at home, totally failed to understand the problems that the so-called liberated women would come to face. So there's been this feminist revolution. They've got out of the home. Now they're working, they're studying, they're traveling, they're doing everything that men do, plus other things that men can't even do. So they've got out of the home, they've got a life, but what these feminists didn't realize is how many problems women would face in their life as a result of this transition. It was never predicted. And so she starts to list them. Number one problem, how do you make a balance between your working life and your home life? Because the reality is that until today, most women who do go to work still have to come back and run the household. Even though they go to work, they still have to come back and they still have to run the household. And then there's the whole issue around child care. Getting other people to look after your children so you can work. That's a big issue. In fact, a recent study that was done in Oxford University concluded after years and years and years of research 
the children who were cared for by other than their mothers, in other words, they were put into childcare, they were put into nurseries from a young age, and their mothers did not care for them, these children were more likely to become drug users, alcoholics, to be socially dysfunctional and not function properly in society and commit crimes. This is what the study concluded. That children who are looked after by other than their mothers were more likely to be dysfunctional socially. This is what they found. So this is one of the problems of getting out of the home and getting a so-called life, as they call it. And then she goes on to mention that some women are actually cut out for domesticity and they became casualties of feminism. So she's admitting in her article, some women actually are good at being mothers and staying in the home. Of course, really, I think this is disingenuous. I would say that most women are good at being mothers and caring and looking after the home. It's a very, very small minority of women who function really well outside that environment. Not the other way around. There's a lot of problems with it, and she's admitting it. And then she mentions the collapse of marriage. She says that marriage would collapse to its lowest ever levels here, meaning in England, in the West. Marriage has collapsed to its lowest levels. And why? What's the reason she gives? Because men are relieved of being providers and they walk away from commitment. So when women are out working, the man doesn't have to provide. He doesn't have to commit. What's the purpose of marriage? We're equal partners. We both contribute equally. We both bring in the same amount of money. So the man doesn't feel he needs a commitment. What is he committed to? So marriage is crumbling, partly because of this mentality that has been a byproduct of feminism, which these early feminist authors never predicted. And it goes on to say, nor that getting pregnant could be as much of a problem as not getting pregnant for women who postponed motherhood. In other words, here's the other issue. Women want to have babies. It's in their biology. They're programmed to have babies. And if they don't start having babies, women, they reach an age when they reach about 35. If they haven't had children, many, many women, if not most women, who reach that age without having children, they begin to suffer not only psychologically, but even physiologically, their body begins to suffer and their minds begin to suffer from that. Their body actually starts sending out chemicals and signals for them to get pregnant. And it gets something that actually begins to take over their mind and they suffer from it. And a lot of women are having problems. They're finding it hard to get pregnant. They're finding it hard to conceive, hard to build a partnership in which they can raise children because they've had a career of working and earning and so on and so forth. And this is a real problem. Another problem that was not predicted by these early feminist writers. And the other one, guess who does most of the part-time low-paid work? Guess who does most of the part-time low-paid work in the West? Women. Yeah, women. Despite all of this, women's liberation, women are equal, until today in the West, women get paid less for the same jobs as men. They do the same jobs as men, they get paid less, they don't achieve high places in companies, and even those who do, they have to almost sacrifice their femininity. They have to start behaving like men in order to be able to achieve that type of level. But the fact is that most of the women who do work, their work is part-time and low-paid compared to men. So that's what she mentions, how these feminist authors fail to predict these things. And so when we look at Islam, 
When we look at Islam, my brothers and sisters, what do we see? We see a religion, guidance from the Creator, the one who created the man and who created the woman. The one who created us, Allah, knows us better than we know ourselves. He gave us guidance. He gave us a paradigm. He gave us a way for us to live. And that way for us to live includes how men and women should behave. And that is why the Quran tells us that men, men are the maintainers and protectors of women. That is the man's job, to be the maintainer and to be the protector of women. In fact, in a proper Islamic state, a proper Islamic society, I don't mean a country with Muslims in. Most of our countries are countries with Muslims inside. No, but a society that truly runs along Islamic values. If a woman does not have a husband or a father or uncles or brothers or male relatives to look after her and care for her, the state does not oblige her to go out and find work. The state takes the responsibility of being the maintainer and the protector of women. That's what would happen in a truly Islamic society. The emir takes that responsibility. The woman has that right. It's her right to be able to stay at home. She should not be forced out not by the reality of her condition or by the propaganda of society to go and work. She shouldn't be pressured to do that. Rather, in reality, she should be helped and aided to contribute to society in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated that for her. How does Allah and how does Islam elevate? And it certainly does. Who could study the religion of Islam with an open heart? Who could study the religion of Islam and read what the Quran and read what the Prophet ﷺ says about women in the position of the mother and fail to recognize the lofty and high status that Islam gives to women? You have heard the verses. You have heard the hadith. You have heard them again and again about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the meaning of which reverence Allah and the wombs that bore you. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put reverencing himself and reverencing your mother together. And how could it not be when paradise, as we all know, lies at the feet of your mother from serving your mother and being kind to your mother and caring for your mother and especially your mother because your mother you could never pay her back the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you can never pay your mother back ever for what she has done for you your father if you found your father as a slave and you set him free you bought him and set him free you'd pay him back but your mother you can never pay her back never and there's the famous story when a young man he comes to Omar ibn al-Khattab and he is carrying his mother on his back. He says, Ya Omar, I have carried my mother on my back for the whole of the Hajj. Did I pay her back now? He says to him, you did well, you did good. But young man, you didn't even pay her back for one tear she shed when she gave birth to you. And they say that Islam doesn't respect women? Is this subjugation? No, this is honor. This is dignity. This gives the woman honor and dignity when she does that thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uniquely for her. Uniquely for her. She is the bearer of children. She is the one who carries that child month after month, difficulty after difficulty through hardship, and it doesn't only finish when that child is born. Then she feeds and cares for and nurtures that child. What she does for her child, 
That is the reason she is deserving of so much honor and respect. So when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Who has the most right to my kindness? He ﷺ said, Your mother. And he said, And after that, your mother. And after that, your mother. And after that, then your father. Your mother, your mother, your mother. Then your father has the most right to your kindness. This is the status of the mother in Islam. But my dear brothers and sisters, I want the theme of my talk today, the end of it to be slightly different. It's not really going to be now a talk about how brilliant the position of women in Islam is compared to the position of women in the East and the West. We've heard that many times, alhamdulillah. But the question I want to ask, I want to ask you, my dear brothers and sisters sitting here today, I want to ask the sisters, I want you to ask yourself, are you fulfilling your roles? Are you fulfilling your obligations? Are you behaving the way that you should as Muslim women? Are you being the mothers that you should be? Are you being the daughters that you should be? Are you being the sisters that you should be? Are you being the wives that you should be? And oh Muslim men, are you treating women the way the Prophet ﷺ treated women? Are you treating your women as Muslims? Or are you treating them in another way? Here is my opportunity to reply to an Imam. A sister writes to me, Abdul Rahim. She's a qualified doctor. She's got married to a man in England. So she comes to live with him and of course his parents. Now the poor lady is having the most terrible time because not only does she have to look after her husband, of course she has to serve her in-laws. And she asks me and writes to me about her situation. So here's some revolutionary stuff for you brothers. You're not going to like this, I'm sorry to say. I told her, it's not your obligation to look after your in-laws. Your obligation in Islam is to look after your husband. It's your husband's job to look after his mom and dad, not your job. Your job is to look after your husband and your children. If, if you look after his parents and it's a good thing for you to do, then that is sadaqah from you and kindness from you to help your husband fulfill his duty. This is her husband. She is pregnant with morning sickness. Yet this man wakes her up even though she's very tired, very sick. So she has to make a cup of tea for his parents. He could do it himself, but he doesn't. He has to wake his wife up to do it. Well, I said, that's disgraceful. I said, that's disgraceful. What sort of behavior is that? What sort of husband is that? What sort of man is that? According to this imam, wouldn't even dream of asking Abdul Rahim Green questions like that. She would go and do this without even a thought. Subhanallah. Anyway, the difference is, Alhamdulillah, my religion is Islam. My deen is Islam. My prophet is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't follow any culture. I follow what has been taught by Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here's my answer to the Imam. I hope you see it on TV. There is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. You can verify it. It's a well-known hadith and I'm sure it's authentic. Do you know the hadith about the three men who are traveling and it begins to rain and they seek shelter in a cave? Do you know that hadith? And the rocks fall down and the block the entrance to the cave? You all know the hadith, just about everyone's shaking their head. So I'm not going to go through the whole hadith, but I'm going to remind you of one relevant aspect to this hadith. Here is the relevant aspect. One of them, he says, Oh Allah, 
I used to go and work in the fields. And it was my habit every evening to give my parents a glass of milk before they went to sleep. And one day I was delayed in my working in the fields and I came back and I found that my parents were sleeping. And so I waited by their bedside until they woke up. Even though my wife and children were crying out of hunger, I waited beside their bedside until they woke up so I could give them the milk to drink. Now, let's give the Imam's version of this hadith. I came back from the fields. Every day I tell my wife, go and give my parents some milk. One day I come back late, I sit down on the bed, I'm very tired. Oh, but their parents are sleeping. No, you stay there by the bed until they wake up. And when they wake up, you give them a glass of milk. No, paradise, brothers, lies at the feet of your mothers. You, you under your mother's feet. Not your wife under your mother's feet. You under your mother's feet. You serve your parents. That's your job. If your wife helps you, Alhamdulillah, you should thank her. My dear wife, thank you for helping me to look after my parents. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate her. Love her more. Be grateful to Allah that he gave you a wife like that. And I encourage all the sisters. I'm not discouraging you sisters from helping your husbands. No way. I am not discouraging you. But what I can't stand is this ignorance. This ignorance that people push. These are the same people. I know a lot of brothers. I remember they told me before their organization came along, the imams, the so-called imams, forbade women from learning the Quran. They forbade women from learning the Quran. Why? Because it's a waste of time. Women shouldn't learn deen. Women shouldn't learn Quran. This is their so-called imams version of how women are supposed to be. But what I can't stand is this ignorance. This ignorance that people push. These are the same people. I know a lot of brothers. I remember they told me before their organization came along, the imams, the so-called imams, forbade women from learning the Quran. They forbade women from learning the Quran. Why? Because it's a waste of time. Women shouldn't learn deen. Women shouldn't learn Quran. This is their so-called imams version of how women are supposed to be. Alhamdulillah, these brothers, mashallah, Allahu Akbar, and sisters changed that part of society. They helped change it. Their group and organization helped change it. And because of that, by the way, because of what they did, at least in part because of what they did, is amongst the most educated populations in the world. Because you know why? When you educate a woman, you educate all the children. She's the first school. She is the first school. You educate her, she educates the children. You educate a man, what does he do? He goes to work, he, this, he doesn't have time when he comes back to teach the kids. This is why, of course, educating the women is so important. But sisters, I want to ask you, especially some of us living here in this very nice, luxurious land. I wonder how many of you are really mothers. Are you the mother? Or is the maid the mother? Are you the mother? Do you care for the children? Do you nurture them, care for them, feed them, look after them? When they're ill, you take care of them? Are you the one who educates them? Or is it as soon as you possibly can, you send them off somewhere to be educated by someone else? What does being a mother mean? What does being a true Muslim mother mean? That's something I wanted you to think about. And what does being a true Muslim wife mean, my sisters? What does it mean? Are you really the wives that you should be? Supporting your husbands the way that you should? Giving them the support that you should? Obeying them? Beautifying yourself for them so when they come home from this fitna, this place of fitna and this land of fitna, say, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, I've come back to my beautiful wife and my beautiful home. And he forgets all his worries. And he forgets all his woes. That's how a good wife should be. The best women are the ones who when you look at them, you are pleased. And when you ask them to do something, they do it. 
My sisters, I ask you, are you the daughters you should be? To your fathers, to your mothers? Or are you like those people the Prophet wasallam said would come at the end of days? And maybe this hadith has this meaning, maybe it doesn't. It's one of the signs of Qiyamah, that a woman would give birth to her master. That maybe this means the children will treat their parents as slaves. Do you treat your mother and father like that? As if they are your servants? As if they are your slaves? No, my Muslim sisters. Be a servant to your mother. Be a servant to your father. And all of you, you must encourage each other and help each other to obey Allah, to worship Allah, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Brothers and sisters, it's been a very hard talk. It's been a very tough talk. I have to finish with a joke. I have to finish with this joke. I won't finish, I have to make a comment about it. I heard this just the other day. This man, he comes to his wife, crying. <laughs> he's crying and he's crying and his wife says, what's wrong? He said, the Emir just made a new law. And he said that unless all the men get married to two or three or four wives, we will chop our heads off. She says, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, why are you crying? That's good. You'll die shaheed. <laughs> and uh, I think I was laughing for about 10 minutes after I heard that. The, you know, the point being, brothers, I am honestly not encouraging all the brothers to go and get second wives. But it is a piece of advice to all of us. Yeah? Let's not try to make Islam the way we want it. Let's not try to make Islam the way we want it. Allah has given us beautiful guidance. You know, our problems come as Muslims, individually and collectively, as men and as women. When we don't follow that guidance from Allah, not only we don't follow it, brothers and sisters, we have to love it. We have to love this deen, not the bits that suit us, not the bits that sound nice to us. Oh yes, I like that bit in Islam that says paradise lies at the feet of the mother, but I don't like that bit that says this and that. No, brothers and sisters, we have to love all of it because it's guidance from Allah and it's good for us whether we know it or not. So I ask Allah, I plead with Allah, I beg with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all upon the footsteps of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we take from our hearts our false desires and fill our hearts with the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the love for his deed. I also make dua that our brothers in Islam that you become the best of men. Do you want to know how to become the best of men? By being the best husbands. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. And who was the best to their wives? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to help in the home. He used to help his wives. He used to help out in the home. Subhanallah, that's how he was. When he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back from fighting, from teaching, from governing, he would serve his family. He would serve his family. Not get his family to serve him. That's how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. That's his sunnah, my dear brothers. And the best of women, who are the best of women? SubhanAllah, think about this hadith. And I finish with this. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if a woman performs her prayers, gives zakah and fasts, the obligatory fast, does the pillars of Islam and obeys her husband, Allah will say to her on the day of judgment, Enter paradise by whichever gate you please. And I don't know of a hadith that has the equivalent for men. So sisters, I encourage all of us, my brothers and sisters, to be upon the obedience of Allah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Abdurrahim Green. <laughs> With that very effective talk, Jazakallah khair. By the way, I got some really good news for you. Yeah. Your talk is so effective. Yeah. 
We believe it. I just heard we have a sister who would like to accept Islam by you. Allah Akbar. Hey. Allah Akbar. Takbir. 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 I know Yusuf is just being nice to me because I think he probably is the one who. Okay, where is the sister then? Is she gonna. Right there. See where her hand is up? Right Marshall, where are you, sister? Can you wave your hand? She's I don't, waving I don't even see. I mean, you, you've got a better eyesight than me, and I'm younger than you. Right there. It's that Texas Ranger, you know? <laughs> I can't see. Okay, sister, mashallah, well, we're so happy. I, honestly, everyone here today, we're so happy. And Sheikh Yusuf, mashallah, give me the beautiful news. So it's very simple, alhamdulillah, to become Muslim. I'm just going to ask you to say after me some words in Arabic, which is called the Shahada, the testimony of faith. Once you've said it, alhamdulillah, you are Muslim. And then I'll just repeat it together with you in English. And alhamdulillah, that means you'll enter into the religion of Islam. So, sister, just say after me. Okay. Okay. Ashadu. Ashadu. An. An. La. Ga. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illallah. Illallah. Wa. Wa. Ashadu. Ashadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Okay, we just repeat it in English. I testify. I testify. That there is nothing worthy of worship. That there is nothing worthy of worship. Except Allah. Except Allah. And that Muhammad. And that Muhammad. Is the messenger of Allah. Is the messenger of Allah. Sister, welcome to the beautiful, Thank beautiful you. religion of Islam. Thank Allah. Takbir. Allah. Takbir. Takbir. Mashallah, we have thousands here witness. Okay. To the sister Shahada. Sister, would you like to say a few words before we get on to the next question? I want to thank everybody for accepting me. She wants to thank everyone to accept her into Islam. She's very nervous, but she's overwhelmed by everything. Thank you, thank you very much. Chef, that's every, every person's birthright. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Now for the question answer session. Yes, please. Your name and your occupation before you pose your question. Uh, good evening, Mr. Green. My name is Ryan. I'm in Dubai for six years. I would like to ask you whether the Muslims, the one who are in Islam, are allowed to marry the non-Muslims. The men and the women, are they allowed to marry the non-Muslims? A Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman from the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, who is chaste, meaning she is not someone who has taken boyfriends and so on and so forth. So a Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman from the people of the book who is chaste. To tell you the truth, however, many scholars in Islam did not really encourage this, even though it is allowed. And there's no doubt that it has been allowed, but they discouraged it for many, many different reasons. So basically the answer to that, except for this exception we mentioned, a Muslim should marry a Muslim. And it's not considered to be marriage in Islam. If the two people who are getting married are not Muslim, it's not considered to be marriage. It's not valid as a marriage contract in the Islamic viewpoint, unless for the exception that I mentioned. So basically my answer to you is no, it's not allowed for a Muslim to marry a non-Muslim, except for a man to the Ahl al-Kitab, women who are chaste. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la ali wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ilahi la tu'adhibni fa'inni Ilahi la tu'adhibni فإني مقر بالذي قد كان مني فما لي حيلة إلا رجائي فما
الزمان حيلة إلا رجال